the bat, the birds, and the beasts. A great conflict was about to come off between the birds and the beasts. When the two armies were collected together, the bat hesitated which one to join. The birds that passed his perch said, Come with us. But he said, I'm a beast. Later on, some beasts who were passing underneath him looked up and said, Come with us. But he said, I'm a bird. Luckily, at the last moment, peace was made and no battle took place. So the bat came to the birds and wished to join in the rejoicings, but they all turned against him, and he had to fly away. He then went to the beasts, but soon he had to beat a retreat, or else they would have torn him to pieces. Ah, said the bat, I see now. He that is neither one thing nor the other has no friends. My name is Michael De Groot. And my name is Michael Don Smith. And together we bring you the story of a speech. Great, fantastic, super duper dandy. Hi, Michael. Please hey, with you again. Hey, Michael. <laughs> and um, today the focus is kind of on you and your speciality. Yay, brilliant. So um, we're going to have the storyteller telling us what is a story. In fact, let me just uh, recap. So in our last episode, we mentioned that we wanted to talk about the story of a speech, and we needed to define what a speech was and what a story was, so we could then explain the difference or similarity or the juxtaposition of stories and speaking and speeches. So last episode, we talked about what is a speech. And if you want to know what that is, please look up the last podcast. And this episode, we're going to talk about what is a story. Brilliant. Michael, what is a story? Thank you. Thank you. Now, what we did last time when we tried to go into the detail of what is a speech, we said, let's... What is the dictionary definition? And so I'm going to start in the same place. We're going to say, what's the dictionary definition of a story? And as always... And, I, and, and, I've, and I've looked it up because last time you, you, you looked it up. So shall I say what it is? Please what do. Got, yes, please clarify. do. Yeah, please do. So the technical Merriam-Webster definitions of a story mm. are A... The space in a building between two adjacent floor levels or between the floor and the roof. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd like that. That's brilliant, yes. <laughs> so you have a 24-story building that's full of so stories. So it's a unit of measure equal to the height of the story of a building, one story high. And um, perhaps what we're talking about is uh, go back. Uh, to narrate or describe in a story, to adorn with a story or a scene from history. So that, what's the story of this? What was William of Orange's story? Mm. The more basic ones are that it's an account of incidents or events that have happened, a statement regarding the facts pertinent to a situation in question. It can be an amusing anecdote or not a amusing anecdote. An anecdote is another word for story. It could be a fictional narrative shorter than a novel. The intrigue or plot of a narrative or dramatic work. What's the story of uh, Lost in the Gone with the Wind? What's the story of uh, a sort of character? Another mm. story is a wild, a wide, a widely circulated rumor. A story could be a lie or a falsehood. A story yeah. could be a legend. 
a story, could be a news or broadcast. This tonight's story, Donald Trump is in the UK. Yes. So there's a, there's a lot of ways we use the word story. What would you add to that, Michael? I, it's, that's really brilliant, and that's pretty much everything. Um, did you talk about novels and, and books? We, we, yeah, we mentioned that it, the story or is normally, the, it is shorter, you know, like a children's story. If it's a novel, you wouldn't say I went to bed and read a novel. Mm. A story, you'd say I read yeah. a novel. So that, and, is that what you meant? Yeah, I, I, that's probably what I meant. But And also nowadays in the kind of new digital arena, we've got stories that are being told in podcasts. Um, there are, you know, people can listen to audio books that are stories as well. I, I know that's more about the medium. Um, but yeah, brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you for that opening. That's good. What what I was going to start with is to to kind of think back when storytelling or stories started. And now not that I'm very knowledgeable about it, but what we do know is that the first known or oldest known cave paintings are over 40,000 years old. And first of all, they're very local to us. They're in the Western Europe, in the Franco-Cantabrian region. And also, not so local to us, in the caves somewhere in Sulawesi in Indonesia. And there's different types of stories that have been painted on caves, on caves or inside caves. Some are figurative cave paintings, uh, and they tend to be younger. But there are also non-figurative cave paintings, and this is where the oldest one is, in Iberia, which were done by Neanderthals. And only recently they discovered this, following a study in 2018, where they reckon the oldest non-figurative cave art in Iberia is 64,000 years old. Wow. I mean, that's that, ridiculous. That's that is old. <laughs> you know? So that's when storytelling first started. That's how people captured some of the stories that were going on in their lives, which is just amazing. Obviously, we've kind of moved forward a little bit from that. Um, and now, we don't even think twice about stories, except for, you know, what the, what I like was the false stories, the kind of, you know, the lies and things, which we're now calling fake news stories. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which is a term that's been, you know, made famous through, we mentioned him earlier, Donald Trump. So that was the first thing to say about how old they are. And the second well, thing... Just before you go on to the second thing. Yes. Every time somebody says, or someone, or some authority, or some ex expert, bear in mind the expert is X has been spurt a drip under pressure. <laughs> so I don't listen to experts. No, me neither. <laughs> but and yeah, I so never it, claim to be one either. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we've got, I just want to say from my point, I'd like to say that this is the current um, wisdom on how old it is because every decade or so we get new techniques and dig up another site and they find something older than the oldest it was before. Yes. So this would be the, the current, as far as our research has shown, this is the oldest thing we're aware of. But who knows what they'll dig up tomorrow? Absolutely true. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely true. Okay, can I go on to my second thing? <laughs> yeah. Point number two in point, the story of a story. Yeah, point number two, and that is you or us. We are actually the biggest storyteller in our lives. And the reason I say that is that we have to 
organize in our brain all of the things that go on in our lives, like the events, the things, the places, the people. And we create narratives and stories around that. Very often, incorrectly so, we make up our own stories in our brain about people and situations and things that happen. Uh, we make stories up about um, ourselves, whether we're good at something or bad at something, or we have limiting beliefs, which are stories because they are not true. So that is really important to note because we have practiced storytelling ourselves over and over and over throughout our lives since we were very, very young. And the story then, your story, is the biggest story in your life. And everything else that comes in, people, places, things, events, happenings, occurrences, good things, bad things, all make up the story of you or the story about me. I'm, I'm a walking story, basically. Wow. Um, and so and that, that's when we access things. So we can actually change our story when we falsely remember something. Yeah, absolutely. Because most of what we believe, most of the negative stuff, isn't true. It's not a true, it's a falsehood. It's not true about us. It's not even true about other people. You know, very often we talk about other people and we go, ah, oh, I wonder. You see some evidence about somebody or let's say about your kids, you know, and let's say your kids have gone out for the night or whatever, and you're wondering, what are they up to? Oh, I know. Well, normally they go, they're gone with their maid, so they've probably gone into town for a drink, and then they probably go to the chippy afterwards or a kebab or... De depending how old your kids are. Depending how old your kids are. <laughs> <laughs> or they go to the playground, <laughs> they go to the playground, they've gone out, they've gone with Jasmine and they've gone to the playground and, you know, they should be back at two o'clock and, well, they haven't come back at two o'clock, where are they? Has something happened to them? They haven't contacted me, you know. So we make up all of these stories about things that are not true. We fill our brain with it. It's important to know that we do this and that's why we connect with stories so well, right? Because we already tell stories in our brain, we create these stories. Therefore, when we hear a story, we can relate to it so much easier because we've been practicing this stuff forever. <laughs> yeah. Well, you said there that most of the negative things we believe are these stories that aren't true and that presumably is going to diminish us or reduce us or disempower us how no and the positive stuff we we make up can be not true as well yeah so people people <laughs> yes. do have memories of the positive things that aren't true yes. and they do that rightly or wrongly, but it empowers them. Because, well, yeah, when I was at school, I was the best basketball player until you meet somebody who was at school with you. And they say, did, 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 did Don say that? He wasn't. He couldn't even play basketball at school. Mm, but mm. We, we can embellish our memories to falsely make us good. But however, what about, do you say our, our whole life is a story, you said? Is that right? You know, yes, we yeah. We carry as big a story. I just want to be a little, a little bit naughty here, a little bit esoteric. Yes. Are we carrying stories of our future with us, of things that have yet to happen? <laughs> we, we do make up stories about the future, 100%. Because we want a better life for ourselves very often. So everybody is on a journey, on a life journey. I, often what I say to people, and people kind of look at me and say, well, you don't know. When I say, introduce myself, well, I'm a storyteller. I know your story. And they go, no, you don't. Well, actually, 
<laughs> most most of if you're a human being walking on this planet, the story is the same. You will have different things to happen, but we all have to overcome stuff. We all have to learn to walk. We all have to be educated. We all have to be able to speak a language or other languages. We all have to communicate. We all have to have relationships. The stories are very, very similar. The, the content is slightly different, but the overall structure is basically the same. So when we talk about the future, we do make up stories about the future. We start to project. Um, I, I remember, and this, this relates to, say, speaking. When I was learning to do public speaking through um, Toastmasters, my very first time that I had to do a speech, which is like a seven minute speech, and it's an easy speech because this first speech is about yourself and you should really know about yourself. I was traveling to work by car and this, I was going to be speaking in the evening. Whilst I was thinking and rehearsing it, in my mind, I was getting butterflies. I was feeling nervous and I was nowhere near the place I wasn't even in the room, it wasn't even happening, and I wasn't even doing it. But I was getting the feeling as if I was already there. So you project yourself into the future, and literally your nervous system believes it's true. Wow, so that's the power of stories you're illustrating there, that the mind cannot distinguish between a vividly imagined story and reality correct in terms of the chemicals it releases if it's you know dopamine if you're happy if it's scared cortisol so you're saying this even thinking about or what we're saying now is that storytelling is a way of thinking that allows you to access the new, your neurology. So you were in the car, not at the place, but you imagined you were at the place and your body pumped the appropriate drugs to prepare you for where you're going to be. Correct. Correct. Wow. So what is a story, Michael? <laughs> well, um, this, usually if we talk about the structure of a story, the story tends to have a beginning a middle and an end. That's simple to say, right? It, it gets more complicated when you delve into it a little bit deeper. But generally speaking, there has to be roughly four stages. There are more. There are more in the hero's journey, which we'll probably talk about on another podcast. But if we talk about just the basic four stages of a story, to begin with, you have the story set up. So you have to explain the characters, where it's taking place, the events surrounding it, uh, who's involved, just the story plot that you begin with. The second thing is the issue, the present issue, let's say. What is, what is occurring? What needs to be done? Uh, what is you know, what are some of the serious things and the good things that are happening in this present kind of issue? And then um, you have the impact. So what is the impact of all of these things that are happening? And I know you're... So, 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 go so, so, just really good. Don't lose point. so I'm just wanting to capture that and show you sort of of the four steps, step one is the setup. Yes. Yeah. And yes. now you're, you're saying that step two is the, is the impact? No, step two is the issue, the present issue. Okay, the issue, the, 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 the thing, the problem, the, the change. Okay, so the challenge, setup, the challenge. The challenge. The, yeah. The, I like challenge. Yeah. Setup, the challenge, and yeah, and three now is? Impact. So how is the challenge impacting the people? It's generally always about the people, isn't it? Um, how is it going to, you know, impact the individuals, 
the situation, where is it going to go, what's the result. So generally speaking, the story will convey to us the, the potential things that might go wrong. Usually it is always about things that might go wrong. Right? <laughs> it's, it's very rare that it's about things that are going to go right. Like a, there will be happy stories, but they're not as interesting because we like to see a problem because that's the story of our own lives being resolved. And also it needs to be relatable. So we can relate to something that is going wrong or the impact of it. And we kind of go, yeah, we, we know how that feels because, I mean, of course, in stories, it's dramatized significantly if we talk about movies or books or whatever, because they need to keep you hooked in. Yeah, well, just to go in there, the reason, a reason bad news sells and gossip is usually negative is to do with the snake brain and the amygdala. Yes. So the amygdala, two almond shaped thingies on either side of your head in the brain, they're like the, they watch everything. They see everything. The billions of bits of information coming into your system. They're also in the amygdala says, is this dangerous or not? One of the things it does. And so we're heightened to watch out for the tigers. Yes. We're not heightened to watch out for the, the Tweety birds or the leaves at that level because the tiger is going to kill us. So therefore we're prime. We're primed to increase attention of things that are dangerous. So if someone is telling a story, then if it's got danger and intrigue and mystery in it, it's more interesting because it's going to give us information that may keep us alive. Mm. Yes. Because we put ourselves into the story. Yeah. As we're, if we're yeah. living it, you know, you're, you're kind of taking on the issues of the character, characters, and, but you also want them to, as human beings, we want everybody to win usually or to survive and therefore we're kind of on their side again usually it's a story of good and evil and it's like well we want the good to survive which they don't always do and to make it more dramatic a few have to perish <laughs> on the journey <laughs> unfortunately you know uh, but that adds more weight to the ones that do survive because now you're even more supporting the ones that do survive because some perished and it could happen to them. So yeah. that makes the danger even graver and you want to get behind them. Wow, it's real. It's, all the fears have been realized. So when what then happens is in the story, you then have to go backwards and forwards between the what is and what could be. Wow, I like that. Say that again. So to keep the story alive, to keep people interested, you have to keep going backwards and forwards several times between what is and what could be. So it could be, for example, let's say, very simplistic example, um, Clark Kent, who's a reporter at some newspaper, he could be Superman. So at the moment, he's a, just a reporter, but he could be Superman, right? Or, for example, um, I don't know, um, Luke Skywalker in Star Wars, he, could, he, he is just a farmer's son, but he could be, you know, in charge of saving the, 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 the rebellion from being um, beaten down or whatever. So, there, but you have to keep going backwards and forwards and specifically in terms of stuff that happens. So the what is could be, I'm, I'm really struggling and I, if I'm not careful, you know, I'm going to be eaten up by the tiger, but I could also survive. And the survival were being shown that how somebody could survive 
by taking certain actions. So to keep our interest in the story, the writer, the producer, the director has to keep giving us to, because you can't, if we did literally like the issue, the impact and the resolution, that would be a very short story. It would take literally five minutes to make it longer, <laughs> to make it longer. You have to keep going backwards and forwards between what is, what could be, what is, okay. what could be. A, a, couple, a couple of questions, or three questions of then. So in no particular order, why does a story have to be lengthened? And I, I understand for, yeah, why, what cause you said there, to make the story longer, we do this thing. Why do we want to make it longer? To, to just draw us in deeper and deeper, to get us more involved, to get our brain more, give it more dopamine, more relatability, more examples that we go, that, that all of the audience are going to be touched. Because some people won't be touched by the first issue of the what is and what could be. But the next one they come along, they go, now I can relate to that. You know, I mean, they don't say it out loud. This all happens so quickly in our brains. So we okay. think. Okay. So, so is you still, but why? Why do they want to do that? Why do they want to relate? Why do they want to do this? To keep our attention, really. Attention, attention, attention is the currency. Is that what it is? is yes. Is that, the, is that the currency now? And it's, it's, attention a double -T, t e n t i o n and keep us in tension i n t e n s i o n wow and attention is the military isn't it where you stand this attention you pay attention and in wow intention their intention is to keep us in tension yes <laughs> wow <laughs> yeah absolutely Okay, so just just before I forget, so the, the the one was um, you said moving backwards and forwards between the what is and what could be. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about the what was in the story? Where does that play? You obviously have something in mind there. <laughs> well, no, because it, I, I'm just playing with language. Yeah. You know what? So the what play. was is the beginning, really. That's the setup, isn't it? It's okay. It's what happened. Um, using using the old fashioned uh, terminology, once upon a time, <laughs> in yeah. a land far, far away, um, that's the was, almost because there has to be a beginning, as we talked about earlier, and a middle and an end. So the yeah. beginning is where you will get what was. Yeah, because the. Also, these things are quite fluid, aren't they? Because mo modern films, they'll, send, they'll, they'll do a, a scene in the beginning, which is right from the end, <laughs> right at the beginning or in the middle. I know, I know. And I, I heard somebody say that the other day about, for example, Game of Thrones, that apparently in the, somewhere in the series, very early on, they showed something about literally the last episode. Uh, that was going to happen like seven series later. <laughs> That's deep. Yeah. That's planning. Wow. Yeah. So it, it is a very, very clever, clever writer will get people hooked into something like that very, very early on. That leaves them guessing as what might happen in terms of the resolution at the very end which is step four or stage four. So after impact, you've got then the resolution. What's going to, you know, how is that going to come about? After all the kind of backwards and forward, what is, what could be, at some stage, you've got to be deciding what's the new, what's the reward, the new reality, what's the bliss at the end of it all that the, the character or characters are going to get to. and uh, you know, get you across the finishing line, basically. And that story is told in so many different ways, so many different ways nowadays uh, to keep us 
intention and keep our attention. Wow. So set up, challenge, impact, resolution. They're the, the high level structure of every story. Pretty much, but as you say, they do switch it around. You know, they may show you first, they may show you the challenge, right? They may open, the story may open with the challenge, but at some stage, you do need to get to know the setup. You need to know the characters and their backgrounds and the what was and the all of those things to begin with. As well, because no, because nothing has meaning without context. Like so the that. setup, the setup is the context. Yes, because without the context, and that's why the, some stories, um, particular particularly mystery stories, they leave bits of the context out mm. deliberately because you didn't know that that was his aunt. Or in the, you know, in the yes. importance of being earnest. Yes. So b until, but once you get that extra thing to find, oh my gosh, that was the aunt. Suddenly that clicks and everything gets a new meaning because the context is uh, updated. So the setup can actually continue throughout the stories. The story can, you know, you can, oh, that, that, oh, that's because, oh. Yeah. And, and a really, really good example of that is a series that has been really, a police series in the UK that has been really phenomenally successful for one reason alone. It's called Line of Duty. And this has been going on for a number of years. I only discovered it recently and we went back and watched all of, all of them from the very beginning. <laughs> You've been... You did a binge, what were they call They call it. When yeah, you binge watch. Yeah, binge, binge watch. watch. And, and the writing in this particular TV series is very, very clear. And people can watch it on Netflix. You have no clue who is responsible until literally the last 10 or even five minutes of the episode. <laughs> and, but because most who done it stories in police like police stories, whether it's, you know, uh, Columbo. Columbo's uh, a classic, isn't it? Columbo is brilliant. And, but you already have a clue about who did it. Columbo's just uncovering it all, and he knows, kind of, well, but you don't, you know, he keeps it to himself very cleverly until the very end. But you've known all along who did it, right? So, the, but with Line of Duty, you haven't got a clue. You could be kind of thinking, well, it was him or was it? then all of a sudden it's revealed at the end it wasn't at all it was somebody else and but it has to make sense it can't be a character introduced in the last five minutes who correct. fires from his aries so the character's the, the character's always been there the character's always been there and you could have had a suspicion about them and in fact you probably did but yeah. it's still a surprise at the end of it so that bit of the setup is left you know the 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 characters and who's responsible, I, I guess it's the resolution at the end, basically, for us. Yeah. It's resolving for us who actually was responsible for it. But That's let me, I'd like to, if, if we have time, to now take this on to kind of the business world. Okay. Because hopefully a lot of people that are listening to that are going to be business people. And that kind of the distinction that and the mistakes that people make with advertising versus storytelling. Clients mm. come to me, I create animations for my clients and they come to me and they say, I want to promote my product or service. Can you create an animation? I went, yes. What do you want to say? And they say, I just want them to, I just want to tell them that we're different. And we're different than anybody else, which of course everybody says. And if they come to us, they're going to get a, you know, going to master their skills. They're going to get much better at what they do. And they're going to walk away really happy. And they should buy us, right? And majority of the advertising that happens 
is on that basis. It's, this is the product. This is what we're good at. We're different. Buy us. Now, but then you say, well, what, when I ask people, do you like the adverts? 99% of them don't. When I say to them, do you like the movies? 99% of them say they do. There's always 1% that says, no, I don't like movies. So I can't say. I love say, adverts. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love adverts. Yeah. So 99% um, generally don't like the adverts because it's an interruption. And actually, they're not that interesting. They're not stories. But the ones that are, we can remember those. We will remember them for a lifetime. Because everybody knows, OK, we're in the UK, so sorry about our international listeners, but John Lewis at Christmas time do these million, multi-million pound adverts and they're all little stories and people remember them. But if we promoted our product through a story and we shared a story about our product and we put characters in it and we did the setup, the challenge, the impact and resolution, the four stages, then we involve our viewers or listeners. We allow them to relate to it or that, you know, they see themselves in the story. They can relate to it. And they are looking at the resolution or the solution by seeing the same thing that we've all discussed. You know, you're coming to the end and go, oh, yeah, that's me. But how's it going to be solved? You know, wow. I can Wow. I can see the issue, the challenge. I can see the impact it's having because I'm having the same issue and impact or challenge. But how are they going to resolve it? Ah, oh, that's how they resolve it. I need to pick up the phone and speak to them about this. And that's why storytelling in promoting products and service or promoting your business works much better than advertising. Now, the reason advertising works because after all, Facebook are multi-billionaires as a result of adverts. The reason it works, if you take a hammer to a stone and you hammer the stone over and over and over again, it will get a dent in it. And that's no different to your brain. If your brain says the adverts, <laughs> <laughs> if, the, okay. if, the, if your brain sees the advert over and over and over again, it creates a um, a new set of neurons, um, a neural pathway in your brain that will remember it. And the next time okay. you walk into a shop or you're shopping online, you buy the product and you have no idea why you've done it. <laughs> but, but here's the thing there. You, I just want to go with your metaphor and I really, I will repeat that again in case I throw people off hearing what you said. But the metaphor, taking a hammer to a stone, you to make a dent. Why do you take a hammer to a grave? Yeah, <laughs> you smash it, you destroy it. So isn't advertising such a huge hammer now mm. that our ability to, so there's a good word there somewhere, to differentiate, to create distinctions between products that will serve us and products that will harm us is being distorted massively? So we've been hammered so long and they've got such techniques. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So I, so I like your metaphor. So just, just, Ellen, just summarize, because you went through a lot of really great stuff there. The last piece you were saying that we, we could actually end up walking to a store or into an environment already pre-programmed. Yes. To purchase with yep. no conscious... Uh, well, what happens is we've seen the advert over and over and over again. We walk into a store and the, the manufacturer, the brand has put the product in the store right at the front. So you've seen the advert, you now walk into the store and you just pick up the product because it's on promotion. You see it on promotion. You, you, are not conscious that you relate it back to the advert. Impossible that you would be able to do Some people do. They go, oh, I've seen that. I'm going to go out and buy it. Absolutely. No, no. But well, what about, what about the, the, when you walk to the checkout and they've got all the chocolates and the things, and every time, every time you see these things 
on special offer, all the sweets, yeah. low price, and you just, well, I, shouldn't say you, I am now consciously aware that I have to resist this. It's said yes. deliberately to make me yes. make an impulse, an impulse purchase. Yes. Yeah. And, and through that manipulation, right, whether it's food brands or other brands, it's manipulation at the end of the is day. It, is it manipulation or is it education? No, it's manipulation. Uh, I mean, everybody knows what happens. You know, advertisers, brands, they're, you know, the biggest brands in the world. I mean, if you, te if you go back to, we're going off storytelling a little bit, but if you go back <laughs> to, if you go back to product produce was sold in market stalls, right? The high street were just market stalls. Then population grew and we had to manufacture more. And so we had to manufacture all of this additional produce to get people to buy it as well. But we couldn't showcase those products just on market stalls all over the country. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We had to manufacture it. So that we, so that people would buy it. There's a bit of a discontinuity. What I said. Okay, we, have... we well, population growth meant we yeah. had to m produce more. Yes. So we had to produce in bulk. But what happens, or what tends to happen when you produce in bulk to get efficiencies in your factories, you have to generally produce for inventory for stock because we can't just produce on demand because people walk into shops and go, I want it now. I'm not going to order it and wait for it to be manufactured. So but they could, but they could do. It's starting to, yeah, sometimes we can, but generally speaking, I mean, kind of in the Amazon world that we're in, we want it the same day. You know, and that's what, this is what you're saying, though. The Amazon world is a programmed world by the stories of the advertisers. So we, we are, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. I'm just getting you to illustrate it so yes. I can perhaps understand it a bit clearer. Because, you know, the, the power of your story that you're telling on this podcast is so manipulative, influential, educational. One day we'll talk about those three words is that I'm getting it, but I want to understand what I'm getting. Yes, sure, sure. So what, what happened then is we have to produce in factories, create more inventory, and now we've got all this inventory that we need to get rid of. So they started creating these massive fairs where people come together like, um, I don't know, Crystal Palace Fair or whatever, and all of the brands uh, show their show their produce that clients can buy, and so they're now the modern day shopping malls, the modern day supermarkets where we stock things high, and we go here. You are everything is there. You just pick what you want and then pay for it. But in order to keep us doing that. They have to keep telling us that there is this stuff available. And that's why they had to invent advertising to make sure the stock kept being sold. Otherwise, it would just all go to waste, whether it's food or clothing or whatever. It would just all go to waste because we got so much of it. And the, that, there's so many holes, <laughs> not, not in your story, in that, in that approach with that we're suffering from plastics in the ocean. Yes. You know, the, the food mountains that go to rot. So that, and we have drifted a lot away from stories, but it, but it does illustrate the power of stories that the advertisers, Coca Cola, um, is their, you know, their summer adverts. They're just stories, aren't they? It's yes. Really, really engaging. Yeah hypnotic stories hypnotic yeah hypnotic absolutely absolutely hypnotic so we've been going on for a while so how would you how would you sum up then 
what a story is. You've done the bit of why businesses can use it, how businesses do use it. Oh, before that, is there a, a, a moral, ethical role for advertising and marketing and branding? Because we seem to have demonized them in the last few minutes. Is there a moral? Ethical, you know, good use of advertising and branding and marketing. The, yeah, it depends on the outcome, doesn't it? So if you said, well, charities advertise to raise money to do good for people, vulnerable people and vulnerable situations in the world, then you could argue, yes, uh, that's good advertising. If people are advertising because they need to raise money for a worn torn country or a, a population cities destroyed through hurricanes and floods and earthquakes and and then i would argue actually yeah we do all need to know about it so it's more educational but it's asking population to look into their hearts and to help others that are in difficult needs and so from that point of view and that often by the way is done through storytelling. Not always that good, but generally speaking, reasonably good. And I have consulted charities on this as well, because very often they just go, we want to fundraise because we need to raise this much money. And you kind of go, yeah, but I can give my money to another charity because they haven't told a story about why they need it. Um, so, but generally speaking... Well, the story of why they need it. Yes, the story, <laughs> yeah. Generally speaking... Most advertising is to get us to buy stuff that we don't need. Dun, 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 dun. Please Sorry. put your comments in <laughs> below. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you are talking to a minimalist. so. <laughs> well, it's, it's all good. Okay, then, Justin, that's been fascinating. And we've, as usual, drifted around there. But I, 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 my takeaway, certainly, I get the setup, challenge, impact, resolution, and the fact that we, we are our biggest story. Yes. Everything, the, the way we hold ourselves together, we understand our lives, our very existence, is through a narrative of which we're the producer, editor, author, the villain, the hero. We carry all those roles within our story definitely so how would you wrap up your how perhaps you use stories and what the power of a story is just to uh, close well off. um i'll relate it back to one of yours and my um observations when we go to networking events and that is business networking events. It could be other networking, but let's call them business networking events where people introduce themselves and they usually go, hello, my name is Michael. What do you do? Right. And people then share what they do and how they do it. And actually, it's very underwhelming. <laughs> right. I'm really not interested in what you do and how you do it. I'm more interested in why you do it and the why is the story. And I met somebody, I met a solicitor uh, at a networking event and some presentations and we had a chat beforehand. And when I said, so tell me about you, he just told me the whole story about being a lawyer in this organization and how this organization is different. This is where everybody goes. We are different to everybody else. Yeah, that's what everybody says. And um, but I said, OK, so you've told me about your company. Well, I actually said, tell me about you. And you, you just talked about the company. So now tell me about you. Right. And tell me your story. He just he was just animated telling his story and how he got into this job at the solicitor. He's not actually a lawyer. He, he's more of a, you know, kind of coordinator of lawyers and of clients. 
and he he just told a fascinating story about himself. And now I remember the guy, you know, in terms of I don't remember his company, but I remember him. So what I would say to everybody in terms of wrapping this up, the story about you is the most interesting bit about you, not what you do or how you do it, but why you do it and what is your story. And everybody, if you haven't already come across Simon Sinek, and most people now have, he talks about the why. And, and it's so important through that kind of answering the why you do what you do, you have to share your story in order to answer that question. Wow. So, you know about stories, the importance of stories, and I would, my last word would be, get ready to share your story. It's the most interesting and attention and memorable getting bit of you. That's you, it's you, it's your why. Perfect. How do we finish these podcasts, Michael? We just we've say... Got, we've got to have an outro. <laughs> yeah, we just say goodbye and we say maybe <laughs> maybe we could say what's going to happen in the next episode. Well, the next episode, I can't wait to... I can't wait to the next episode because that's where we talk about um, still bringing the story and the speech together. You know, we've talked about what is a speech, what is a story. The next episode is what's the difference between a story and a speech. And obviously, when we talk about the difference, it might be the similarities. So I'm quite keen to hear the differences and then perhaps find out what the point of that is. I look forward to that. So that's goodbye from me, Michael Don Smith. And it's goodbye from him, Michael De Groot. <laughs> sure, sure, bye. Take care. See you in the next episode. See you next time. 